In 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, it says, This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, we lie, and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Now let's bow in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, uh, my, what a good day this has been. My, uh, my heart is full. As far as I'm concerned, nothing else has to happen today for my joy to be full. And yet I'm glad that we have this brief time to come together this evening, not because we have to. We're not under the law. We're under grace. But most of us come because we long to be with your people. We love to sing about you. We love to hear from the word of God about you. We love to be in an environment where we can be drawn a little closer to you. And so, Lord, may tonight, may tonight be no exception. Perhaps we can go a little further into the garden tonight with you. Maybe we can go the extra mile with you. Maybe we can watch with you just a little bit. And as the disciples on the Emmaus Road said, did not our hearts burn as he talked with us along the way? And may our hearts burn tonight as the Word of God speaks to us, as the Holy Spirit deals with us, and as we draw closer to you, for in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Some powerful words in these verses. They talk about restored and continuous fellowship. Christianity is a fellowship. Christianity is a fellowship. Jesus says, this is life eternal, that they might know thee. They need to think about that. He didn't say, this is getting saved, that they might accept thee. He didn't say, this is how folks go to heaven, by accepting you. That's not what the text is talking about. Knowing in that context is not talking about receiving Christ as your Savior. And eternal life in that verse is not talking about eternity. It's talking about the life of God. For God is eternal life. God is life. God is eternal. This is the eternal life. Do you understand what I'm saying? God is eternal life. That's why you can't have eternal life without having Jesus. If you have Jesus, you have eternal life, for Jesus is eternal life. It isn't talking about the duration. Way down there that you can't, there's no end to the road. That's not what we're talking about in time. Eternal life is now, if you have it. In other words, God didn't say, I was or will be. God said, I am. So God is the eternal present. Eternal life is not something we're going to get. Eternal life is something you have and can enjoy. Now, every Christian has it, but not every Christian is enjoying it. And uh, this is life eternal that they might know thee. Know thee. This is life. Jesus said, I've come that they might have life. That's salvation. And that they might have it more abundantly. And so what happens to us in our Christian life is we lose. We lose the joy. And uh, our Christian life is just not all we expected it to be. It's not what we hear it should be. We hear people preach sermons about what the Christian life is and should be. And we assume that since we are not there, that it's beyond our grasp, that we can't have it. Now, some of you in this room tonight know from experience that the Christian life is a wonderful life if it is lived. It is a miserable life if it is not lived, isn't it? I was thinking about this the other day before revival came to our church, and somebody said, now what we, we have a reference point. It was before revival and after revival. <laughs> and by the way, we don't want to fall in love with revival. And I want to make that very clear. We're not in love with an event or a date. We're in love with the, with the Lord, 
and uh, you need to stay there. If you're in love with an event, you're going to get further and further away from it as time. So, uh, you know, every day needs to be revival, but of course the dam can't keep gushing every day. So there is a difference. And a lot of folks get concerned because, you know, uh, the floodgates are not opening every day. Well, there's just not that much water. And you couldn't handle it if, if there was that much water. It emotionally would wear you out. Okay. But I was thinking about this. You know, when you think about the condition of our hearts before revival, for instance, Ron Gidding was a good guy, wasn't he? But he was lost, wasn't he? Do you know that if you had a voting session, you'd have probably voted him in as a deacon? Because we make our decisions on friendship and popularity and busyness. And uh, Brother Dyke and I, I think we were talking about this the other day, that, you know, uh, we're all pretty good guys. You know, I mean, there's so much good in the best of us and so much bad in the worst of us that it behooves the rest of us to say anything, about the, anything bad about us, right? I mean, we're just so good. This guy over here was good. His wife was good. They didn't like each other, but they were good. They hadn't read their Bible and prayed together since Bible college in eight years, but they were good. You see what I'm talking about? We got a church full of good people, but no spiritual people. And by the way, that is what is wrong in churches all across the country. Is it is, it is personality and busyness with no spirituality. Say. Somebody said, get them, wet them, and work them, you know, and embalm them occasionally, you know, in case they die. <laughs> I don't believe that's what ought to be. I don't think that ought to happen. I think that we ought to work out of grace, and we ought to work out of love for the Lord, and we ought to work because we're doing exactly what we believe God wants us to do, and we ought to have joy in doing it. You know, that's what I believe. And I agree with Brother Ralph. I said there are some things we ought to quit doing and maybe some things we ought to start doing. So I just feel the Lord's leading me not to. So you want to be careful. <laughs> you know, you, there may be something you don't want to do. And under the pretense of uh, revival, just trying to worm out of it and make it look spiritual. So you want to, you want to, you know, you want to, you, want to, you don't want to have wildfire burning around here, okay? Pretty soon we won't have anybody in the choir because the Lord leads them out of it. Now what happens? What happens if a Christian, uh, he lo he's lost his joy, he's no longer uh, excited about Christ? What's the problem? Now, I've prayed with enough Christians to, to know that there are Christians who, are, who will say, I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't know what it is. There's obviously something between me and God. I don't know what it is. <clears throat> well, it may be that there's nothing between you and God. And it may be that there is something between you and God. But I do know this, that if the problem between you and God is real, it can be seen. Now listen, let me say it again. If the problem, the thing between you and God is real, it can be seen. And if it can never be seen and identified, it probably is not real, no matter how you feel. I'll talk about that in just a moment. In our text in 1 John 1, 5, it says, And this is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is what? God is light. God is light. Now, let me tell you. I've never been to Vietnam, nor been in battle much. But I think the greatest uh, pain I ever endured was trying to go from the kitchen to the bedroom one night in the dark. And my wife had moved some furniture. <laughs> and I am telling you, when my toe hit that coffee table, I really thought I was going to die. And I was talking to that coffee table in tongues. <laughs> but when the light came on, it wasn't a coffee table. <laughs> it was something else. And the problem is when we're in the dark, we don't know what it is we're kicking against, do we? And we're talking the wrong thing and talking about the wrong thing because we're in the dark. You know what happens is we need to have the light turned on. 
And the Bible says that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all, no shadow of turning, no blemish. If we say that we have fellowship with him, all right, God is perfect light. And the thing about light is uh, it doesn't force itself, it just shines. And uh, light will drive away darkness, and light will fill a room. And God is light. And if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. And we do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. So what the light does is it reveals. That's what light does. Light reveals sin. Light reveals sin. Did you ever notice that uh, taverns and dance halls, and I've never been there, but I've had folks tell me, um, Dyke told me. Did you, ever, <laughs> did, you ever, did you ever notice that these ta ta dives, these taverns and these dance halls, that, uh, I mean, you almost need a candle, I guess, Dyke told me, to get around through them? Did you ever notice in places of sin people like darkness? But you know, a gas station, when he locks up and goes home, he turns on every light on the property, doesn't he? I don't know why he does that. He knows that criminals hate light. And wicked people love darkness. Right? Sure. And so the light reveals. Now, it is the fear of light that keeps men from being saved. Jesus himself said that uh, uh, everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. In John 3.20, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Lest his deeds should be reproved. Now listen, pay attention to me, okay? The Bible says that if a person does evil and has evil in his heart, he will not come to the light, lest his deeds be reproved. That is, they'll be made manifest. So a sinner will not come to the Word of God or to Jesus Christ because it exposes his sinful condition. He gets a little under conviction and he talks, he writes notes, he plays with a songbook. I mean, I've been at this long enough to know when people are trying to not pay attention to what's being said. Okay? I know, you know, you can, I don't have my glasses on, but I, I, when I get them on, I can see. There is something about a sinner, a lost man, that the Word of God makes him very uncomfortable. Why? Because it's light. It's the light that is shining on his heart, and he gets under conviction. I remember a fellow by the name of um, uh, Big Tall Guy. Joyce, where are you? What's his name? Carmen Hudson. She's no help. Carmen Hudson. Okay? I remember when Carmen first came here and got under conviction. That fellow would get up and walk out, and he'd go out in the foyer. And after the church, I, I re this man looked like he'd stood out in the parking lot and let, let a rain shower come on him. Of course, it wasn't raining. It was summertime. His shirt was, was drenched with sweat. I couldn't figure out what was wrong with the guy. And he had said in a sermon, uh, been in a sermon that under a sermon that morning, and was under conviction from the Word of God. Of course, he finally got saved and is living for the Lord. But sin, but light reveals sin. Now the thing is, there's not much difference between a saved man and a lost man. The only thing is, the saved man's going to heaven. But I'm telling you that a saved man who is backslidden has a problem with the light also. He wants to avoid the light. He doesn't want to avoid religion necessarily. He doesn't want to avoid playing with his food. He doesn't want to avoid working in church, but he wants to avoid the light. Because the light shines on the inside. And it's the inside that is our problem. It's not our outside. It's the inside in the heart. Remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees in his day? 
He said on the outside, you are whited sepulchers, garnished, but on the inside full of dead men's bones, right? So if we could lift the lid on the sepulcher, we know what we would find inside, right? So we don't want God to lift the lid on our whited sepulcher because the death in there is too much to be exposed. Like so many people have said, if God lifted the lid all at one time, it would be more than we could take. So he kind of raises it up and shines a light in there and says, look in there, and then closes it. And you say, my God, I need to deal with that, and you deal with it. And you say, man, I feel good. Man, it's wonderful to have glorious freedom. And the Lord says, come over here, I want to show you something. And he raises the lid again and says, look in there. And you, oh, my stars, I thought I had revival. And you go and you get, you get it taken care of. Now, brother and sister, I'm going to tell you something. That sepulcher is never going to be clean because it's a sepulcher. If it was clean, it wouldn't be a sepulcher. But it is our responsibility to make sure that we allow the light to shine in there if we're going to have fellowship. You can't keep the lid on it and have fellowship. Now, you can keep the lid on it and look good. You can keep the lid on it and work. You can keep the lid on it and do anything that you're doing right now. Brother Dyke said the thing that got him under conviction was when Pastor Hughes asked the question. What was the question there? Tell us. Take away everything that God is doing and what is left. And you had to say everything. In other words, he said God was not doing anything in my life. I was doing it all. So you see, the, the truth is we could have church if God was dead, couldn't we? See, we could do everything we're doing except have fellowship. You have to have God to have fellowship. You have to have God to have fellowship. You can't fellowship with a God that doesn't exist. But you can do all the other externals. Now then, it is light that reveals. Now, <clears throat> do you ever notice uh, how people... Um, how, how, how they take such good care of their front yard. Hmm? Do you ever notice the front yard, all the weeds are pulled? You know where I'm going already, don't you? Did you ever notice what a show place the front yard is? Flowers, weeds pulled, don't squirm. I wonder why we always do the front yard. And the old wrecked cars, lumber, wrecked bikes, and dandelions that are knee high. Do you ever wonder why they're always in the backyard? What's wrong with your backyard? You know what? Because your folks don't see it. Right? Sure, sure. It's the same principle. We have a front yard Christianity. See? Why? Well, <laughs> oh, this, I love it. <laughs> anyway. We don't have this problem in our house. Both of our yards look the same. <laughs> Nothing hypocritical about us, they're both a mess. <laughs> For everyone that doeth evil, Christians included, everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. See? Um, neither will he come to the light lest his deeds should be reproved. But watch this. He that doeth, see the emphasis is on doing, but he that doeth the truth, not he that does works, he that does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. See, a fellow who's serving God in truth would have no problem in coming to God, would he? Well, why would he? I mean, if I'm serving a class for the Lord in truth, why would I have any problem in going to the Lord and talking about that service? So if we do evil, if there's an ulterior motive, if we're hiding something, then we are not going to come to the light. Why? Because the light will show the truth. 
And just like a lost man, we're afraid of truth. We're afraid of the light as Christians. We're afraid of God. We're afraid of what God will take away from us. We're afraid God will say, you need to get right with Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so. Now, we don't want to get right with them because it feeds our pride if we can stay mad at them. You see, anger is rooted in pride. So if we get right, we're going to have to admit that we are wrong. And I don't have a right to be mad at these people. And I don't have a right to have bitterness in my heart. And I don't have these rights. And I want my rights. So I'm not going to come to God. I'll just keep serving and keep my rights. And so it's this fear in carnal Christians that keeps them from prayer because it is in prayer that the light begins to shine. Two things God uses as a spotlight. One is the Bible and the other one is prayer. And many Christians, not many Christians, but several Christians, they will read the Bible and study the Bible for a lesson or for information. But there's a world of difference in studying the Bible and saying, how can I get my heart right with God? Not what can I do for God, but what can I learn here, what I can be for God. You understand? There's a world of difference. What can I do for God? Let's see, what, what success principle can I learn today? How can I be a good husband? How can I be a good father? How can I, you know, uh, what should I do here? I need a lesson for my Sunday school. I need a lesson. No, that's not what you need. That's not what you need. If we get right, we'll have a lesson we get right, will be a lesson. So it is the light of the Word and the Holy Spirit that reveals to us the sin problem. The Holy Spirit will not deal. Do you under, now listen. You understand why that prayer is the least uh, <clears throat> exercised activity on the part of Christians? It is the least exercised. Fellowships will be the number one attended thing. Have a fellowship, a potluck, a meal, and folks will show up. Okay? Have a contest of some kind. Give away things. People will, people will show up. But the more spiritual the activity becomes, the fewer people will attend it. And prayer is the most spiritual activity you and I could be involved in. And it will be the least practiced by God's people. Now, we have to learn to pray. Jesus said, uh, the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. So we need to learn to pray. We need to enter in and, and, uh, and learn how to do it. But when we begin to pray, it is light that shows sin. You know, I, I honestly thought at the revival meeting, when this revival was taking place, I thought that, you know, I've never thought I was perfect and still and know that I'm not perfect, but I never thought that I had all those problems. I didn't, I didn't know that. And about the third or fourth night into it, I began to get a little uh, sense of uh, self-righteousness. So I, but I went right over, you know, and took care of it, and I was no longer self-righteous. And then the next night, it was something else. And the lid was being lifted just a little bit. It took about three or four nights before the Holy Spirit could even crack the lid. And every day, God lifts the lid. And I have to go back and look in there. And what I see is nothing but, but filth and death and corruption. And I have to run back and say, I know that in me dwells no good thing. And my father says, don't despair. I love you anyway. And I'm not demanding you to be good. That's not my demand. I only demand that you let Jesus live through you. And I say, I can do that. I can do that. And you can too. You can too. Well, after the light shines, things are seen. Once sin is identified, it ought to be acknowledged. You see, the word confess has to do with saying something. That is, we need to say exactly what the Lord says about sin, right? Did you ever notice how we pray in generalities? You listen to folks pray. Dear Lord, what we need to do is get right with God. Please help us to get right. 
we all have problems. Did you notice how I've avoided saying anything about me? Or we'll get in a prayer meeting and we'll pray for missionaries or we'll pray for our government or we'll pray for the abortion clinics or that they'll all burn or something, you know. And we'll deal with everything in the world except the issue. We speak in generalities, you know. And when we talk in generalities, it's because we're avoiding. There, we have this avoidance. We, 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 it's hard for us to deal with it, you know. But Daniel, when he prayed, Daniel said in 9.20, And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sins, he says, In the sins of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before God in his holy mountain. Daniel confessed his sins. Nehemiah did the same thing down in Nehemiah 1. You need not turn there, but he said, And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat and I wept. And I mourned certain days, and I fasted. Did you notice how different that is from anything we know as Christianity today? He said, I sat down. We've got to be jumping around and be active. And then he said, I wept. We've got to be laughing and having fun. And then he said, I mourned days. We're lucky if we can cry. And then he said, I fasted. We'll skip that. And then he said, I prayed before the God of heaven. Now, what I'm trying to impress upon you is how different Bible Christianity is from secular Christianity. It's completely different. The Bible Christianity tries to break us, bring us to a place of contrition so that joy then can be evident, and it can be real joy, you see. And we'll hear about that in a minute. Notice what he said. And I, he said, I beseech thee, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and terrible God. He knew who God was. Remember the attributes of God? You've got to know who God is. Revival begins in the heart of God. So you've got to know God. And Nehemiah knew God, and he addressed him with an understanding. Notice what he said. The God of heaven.